Hello, everyone. I'm Francis Collins, the director of NIH. I want to thank CTF and Annette Bacher for inviting me to participate in this very special neurofibromatosis conference. But our best plans to all be together at this point got disrupted uh, by COVID-19 by this bad guy. And that's where I'm spending a lot of my time trying to figure out how to uh, deal with this virus to develop better means of diagnostics, of coming up with treatments for people who get infected and for speeding up as much as we possibly can the development and deployment of vaccines. And I think I can say this is all going at remarkable speed thanks to the incredible hard work of thousands of people who dropped everything to try to make that happen. I'm talking to you from my home office in Chevy Chase where I've been pretty much continually for the last 12 weeks managing the NIH and all that that means uh, with Zoom calls and emails and conference calls and all the rest. Uh, but it is a privilege, I think, at a time like this to be able to roll up our sleeves and bring the very best science we possibly can to this global pandemic. And that's very much how I've been focused. But I'm glad that we get to talk about something other than COVID-19 because the rest of medical research is just as critical as it always has been. And so it's good not to let that go sliding off to the side somewhere, but let's focus right now on the progress that's happened with neurofibromatosis, especially as we're entering this conference's idea of a double celebration, the 30 year anniversary of the identification of the NF1 gene, and just this April, FDA approval of the first effective treatment for NF1. So those are pretty good reasons uh, to have this be a special celebration. I want to give a lot of credit uh, to the Children's Tumor Foundation and to its predecessor, the National Neurofibromatosis Foundation, for the role that they have played at every step along the way in making this kind of progress possible. For me, uh, back when I was working on neurofibromatosis in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, having NNFF, which is what we called it at that point, as a partner was just critical. And Peter Bellerman, who was at that point uh, the director, uh, was a wonderful leader and also became a really good personal friend. And that tradition continues with Annette at the helm, pushing this agenda forward in really exciting ways and bringing people together and recruiting investigators to work on this issue along with many of you. So that is really a good thing. I can even say a specific uh, example of the way in which the foundation has supported NF research might be uh, the early Young Investigator Award that was granted to a member of my Michigan team who played a central role in the gene discovery and has been a major leader in NF1 research ever since. And you'll hear from her very soon. That's Peggy Wallace, who will speak with you later today. Before I say more about NF1, which is the part of the story that I know best from my own research efforts, I do want to also recognize really interesting progress in NF2, including uh, the promising Intuit trial for NF2, which is led by Scott Plotkin, who will also be speaking uh, later today and has also been supported by CTF. Well, since it is the 30th anniversary, maybe I could reflect briefly on the story that led to the discovery of the NF1 gene in 1990. For me, I first met neurofibromatosis as a medical resident and not as a research problem, but as a medical challenge, uh, taking care of a few patients who had NF1 and being fascinated by the fact that so little was known about its cause and that the manifestations were so variable from patient to patient and that for the most part, it was a disease that had not had much attention paid to it despite its frequency, one in 3,000 people. And so after additional training at Yale and then getting on the faculty at Michigan, I decided this ought to be a major focus for me as a guy who was dedicated to the idea of finding genes that were responsible for heritable diseases. NF1 seemed like a very important target. Uh, and so joining up uh, with other uh, research groups who were working on that same effort and again, uh, the foundation helped a lot by coordinating those meetings, encouraging people to share data, gradually honing in on where the gene might be on chromosome 17. Ultimately, with my team at Michigan then, it was consisting of Peggy Wallace and Doug Marchuk, uh, Lona Anderson and Jane Fountain, 
uh, we were able uh, to identify the actual gene itself right there on chromosome 17 uh, by identifying mutations in that gene uh, from people who had NF1. And at about the same time, Ray White's group, which you'll be hearing about later today from David Viscochel, who was part of his group, uh, arrived at the same conclusion. And so we had a photo finish along about the 4th of July in 1990, announcing these results and opening up a whole new chapter in research on NF1, because now we knew finally what was the nature of this gene, what was its normal function, what was it there to do, and how is it that misspellings in that gene could give rise to such a puzzling disease with so many different manifestations, even within the same family. So the, the process got started in a big way then about trying to understand what the gene's function was and what could be done about it. And a wide range of experts over the course of those last 30 years have come alongside to try to answer that. Everything from very basic science questions to clinical management. Again, uh, my protege, Peggy Wallace, played a big role in that. Another one I may mention, David Gutman, who runs the NF Clinic at WashU, uh, joined my group shortly after the finding of the gene and has dedicated his career pretty much also to figuring out ways uh, to identify ways to help people uh, with this condition. So in a small way, even though I have not been able to work on the condition myself uh, for quite a while since I got involved in the Human Genome Project shortly after that, it's wonderful to see how many of you have continued that search, uh, that journey, uh, that effort to find answers. And it will be, I think, not unreasonable to say uh, that the search for NF1, along with a few other genes like cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy and Huntington's disease, which all succeeded in the late uh, 80s or around 1990, uh, we're also an indication that if we really wanted to extend that to the thousands of other genetic disorders that were less common and therefore were going to be even harder uh, to uh, find the cause, we really needed something to work with. Mainly, we needed a map and a sequence of the human genome. So it, it's not too big a stretch to say the Human Genome Project really was built on the sense that if we wanted to do for other diseases, uh, what became possible for NF1, uh, we needed to have a genome project to make that happen. And of course, that is what happened and consumed the next 13 years of my life. And uh, ultimately in 2003 resulted in the unveiling of a reference sequence of the human genome. And my gosh, so many things have happened since then in terms of technologies that have allowed us to understand a lot more about these genetic diseases and what happens and to begin to develop better ideas about therapy. In that regard, I think we can also say that 2020 is a landmark year for NF1 because of the approval by the FDA of the first drug for NF1, namely selumetinib. And I have to say, this has been a fascinating story. It was arrived at because of all that hard work of understanding what the normal function of the NF1 gene is and then trying to figure out how to compensate if that wasn't quite doing its job. It was not possible to come up with a way to directly replace it. Maybe someday we'll get there with gene editing, but it was more about how do you compensate for that pathway not quite doing what it should by tweaking another part of the pathway and a MEK inhibitor emerged as a, a possible way to go forward. Uh, that MEK inhibitor, selumetinib, was developed not for NF1, but as a possible treatment for cancer. Uh, it didn't seem to be particularly effective in that space. But uh, our own Birgit Wiedemann at NIH, uh, working on NF1 since 2001, began looking at this as a possible drug that might help and systematically working through step by step, got more and more evidence to show that it looked like it could be what we would need, particularly to treat those individuals uh, with the most rapidly aggressive form uh, of pediatric plexiform neurofibromas. And starting in 2001 and working with Andrea Gross, and you'll hear from both Drs. Wiedemann and Gross shortly, ultimately were able to show the benefits of this were really quite substantial. And I'm sure they will show you the evidence and maybe even some case examples of how this has been life-changing for many people, particularly children who have had the most significant consequences of NF1 early in their lives and for which we desperately needed treatment. 
So that is a very good news story indeed. Looking back over those 30 years, uh, I can see the hard work that's been done by so many of you who are now involved in this particular 30 year celebration and who are very much part of the CTF family. And I just wanna say thank you for all of that effort over the course of those years where many times it seemed like we were so far away from being able to understand this well enough to come up with an effective treatment. And now we have one, but let's not rest because we don't yet have the ultimate a menu of treatments or maybe even a cure. And so I'm hoping at this meeting, as you listen to the presentations, as you get to know each other virtually, because that's what we have to be doing in this instance, uh, there will be some ideas that happen, some light bulbs that go on, some collaborations that get started. This is the most exciting time in medical research that humanity has ever had the chance to experience. Okay, it's a little slowed down now because of COVID-19, but we will get through this and we will be able to once again uh, apply the full brain power and talent and experimental and clinical skills uh, of our researchers uh, to try to take this to the next level. And I charge all of you to do that and to make this year 2020 not just a moment to celebrate what's happened, although you should do that, but also a moment uh, to have vision about where we could go next with NF1 and with NF2 and all the conditions that CTF represents in terms of the need for more answers. So thank you to all of you for gathering, even remotely, but most especially thank you for thinking about where we could go and making this meeting into an occasion of real creative brainstorming because people are waiting. Uh, there's a lot more we have yet to discover. So go out there and make it happen. Thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be able to speak to you, even though I wish we were all together in the same room.